a highly symbolic visit, showing off Europe's commitment to Ukraine. Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission president in Kiev, once again, meeting the Ukrainian president Volodymyr Zelensky. But this time, she's not alone. No less than 15 European commissioners have joined her for various meetings with the Ukrainian government. All this, despite the fact that the country's still at war. Meaning this gathering and these pictures will go down in history. But beyond the symbolism, President Zelensky wants the European Union to introduce more sanctions against Russia, as he thinks they're, quote, slowing down. We will introduce with our G7 partners an additional price cap on Russian petroleum products. And by the 24th of February, exactly one year since the invasion started, we aim to have the 10th package of sanctions in place. Also on the table, how to promote the integration of Ukraine into the EU. But Kiev's hope for quick membership was frustrated, as there's no agreements between member states for a fast-track procedure. They say more work must be done. Ukraine says it will continue fighting against corruption. While EU commissioners were meeting with Ukrainian ministers, the EU Foreign Affairs Chief, Joseph Borre, was with the Prime Minister, promising to double the number of Ukrainian soldiers to be trained, as well as campaigning to disactivate mines. On Friday, the visit continues with an EU-Ukraine summit. Our Sasha Vakalini has more. Ukrainian authorities insisted that the EU-Ukraine summit should take place here in Kyiv and not in Brussels. They wanted the delegation of senior EU officials to see how the country is operating, how they're introducing measures and requirements whilst at the same time defending itself for almost one year now, something that Kyiv certainly believes deserves the EU membership. Sasha Vakulina, Euronews, Kyiv. The Russian president laid a wreath to mark the 80th anniversary of the Soviet victory over the Nazis in the Battle of Stalingrad. Putin placed it below the Eternal Flame, which is part of the memorial complex in the city now known as Volgograd. He used his speech to draw parallels with the war in Ukraine. The five-month battle of Stalingrad is regarded as the bloodiest battle in history, with an estimated two million soldiers and civilians dying. The Nazis raised most of the city to the ground before surrendering on the 2nd of February 1943. This was a major turning point in the Second World War, and the victory remains a source of great pride in modern Russia a feeling the Kremlin wants to weaponize. Russia is continuing its onslaught in eastern Ukraine as the latest intelligence suggests Moscow is planning a major new offensive on the anniversary of its invasion around February 24th. It's no surprise Kiev is stressing it needs more weapons, and now. Ukrainian forces on the front line of fighting near Solodar have been reporting shortages in ammunition for howitzers, limiting the range of their artillery capacity. And while Ukraine's troops are keeping up the fight, its civilians are having to live with the consequences of war. This school in the Kharkiv region was destroyed early in the conflict. There's been no opportunity to rebuild. On the political front, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky welcomed his Austrian counterpart, Alexander van der Bellen. Kyiv is due to host a summit with leading EU officials this week, seen by Ukraine as highly important in its push for membership of the 27-member union. Fighting institutional corruption is also key to that bid. A fresh wave of anti-corruption raids on high-profile figures, including one of Ukraine's richest men, and on the home of a former interior minister, appears to be part of that aim. Nighttime in Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine, and the sound of shelling from both sides fills the skies. Locals are forced underground, and in one cellar, six children and about 20 adults try to occupy themselves and try get some sleep. 
One girl has been living in the shelter for six months with her grandparents. Her mother had to stay in a town taken by the Russians. When we lived in this other town, we had a bombing right across the street from our house. I was so scared and it's still with me. When we came here, I saw that it was worse, but I convinced myself that I could survive. I tried to forget the bombing. It's dangerous everywhere. In Ukraine, there is this threat, and at least here, we are home. Daytime falls, and locals leave their shelters to get food off Ukrainian soldiers. A week ago, we were still holding our positions, but now we are forced to retreat. We are going to put our best soldiers further back to recover and show our strength. With the ongoing fighting, being far from cover is always a risk, but many have learned to adapt. At first I was startled all the time, and now I stay home. But the time above ground is kept to a minimum, the elderly lady admits, when she goes back into her cellar, where she sits and says her prayers. The European Central Bank has raised its three key interest rates by a further half a percentage point as it tries to bring soaring inflation under control. The benchmark lending rate now stands at 3%. The ECB's president also signaled the bank would continue with its policy of raising rates to combat rising prices. In view of the underlying inflation pressures, we intend to raise interest rates by another 50 basis points at our next monetary policy meeting in March, and we will then evaluate the subsequent path of our monetary policy. Keeping interest rates at restrictive levels will over time reduce inflation by dampening demand, and will also guard against the risk of a persistent upward shift in inflation expectations. Prices for food, fuel and other commodities has been rising steadily for more than a year. The pace of growth has slowed in the last few months, but inflation remains far above the ECB's 2% target. The Bank of England also raised its interest rate from 3.5% to 4%. It was already at its highest level for 14 years, but here too inflation remains a persistent problem.